Hi, welcome to episode 22 of The Comic Source. I'm your host, Jace. In the news, the Image Expo was held this last weekend in San Francisco, and there was a huge list of new creator-owned books announced. I'll put a link down here in the description, and you can go and see the full list for yourself. The one book I will mention that has me most excited is Savior, written by Todd McFarlane with fully painted art by Clayton Crane. The whole entire 8-issue miniseries has been done, so we look forward to that coming out soon. Over on the Marvel side of things, a date has been announced for the Daredevil Netflix series to be released. That is April 10th at 12.01 Pacific Time. All 13 one-hour episodes will go live on Netflix. So I guess that means by about 2 o'clock on April 10th in the afternoon, you can have seen the whole series. And I'm sure there'll be at least a few of you who watch them all by then. In movie news, the Ant-Man trailer has been released and it's been getting a ton of views and it has a lot of people talking. Also coming in February, we expect to see a teaser trailer for both the Fantastic Four and Batman vs. Superman. And in further DC Comics news, they have their big Convergence event starting the last week of March, and then all the rest of their normal books will go on hiatus for two months and will be filled in with these Convergence issues. They've announced that 13 books are ending in March along with the three weekly titles. So that's 25 issues of books that DC is going to need to replace on a monthly schedule if they want to continue to put out the same number of books they've put out for the last six months. So it'll be very interesting to see what new books come out from DC starting in June. The first title I'm going to talk about is the latest Moon Knight series from Marvel Comics. The book was launched with Warren Ellis writing and Declan Shelby handling the art duties and Jordan Belair on colors. Now they handled the first six issues. The next six issues we saw Brian Wood take over as writer with Greg Smallwood on art and Jordan Belair continuing her amazing job on colors. Now even though their six issue run isn't done yet, we already know that Cullen Bunn is going to take over the writing chores as of issue 13 and he's going to do a five issue run with Ron Atkins on art. Hopefully Jordan Belair continues on colors, although that hasn't been announced yet. So each of these writers is getting six, maybe five issues to kind of give their spin on Moon Knight. So even though in a very short time there's going to be a lot of writers on the book. From what we know and have seen so far, they're all keeping a very similar take on the character. Warren Ellis kind of established a new paradigm with his first six issues. And I shouldn't even call them a six-issue arc. It's definitely a six-issue run because even though there's overall themes that run throughout all six of the issues, every one of them is a one-and-done. Each story only takes up one issue. So Ellis didn't really bring in a lot of the typical things we see in, from past series of Moon Knight. There are some ties to the past, but you certainly don't need to have an understanding of who Moon Knight was in the past to appreciate what's being done here. In fact, Ellis has gone so far as to hint that some of the things that we took for granted with Moon Knight, like his multiple personalities or disassociative identity disorder, whatever you want to call it, isn't really what we thought it was. He does a great job of making it feel otherworldly, supernatural, and like I said, even though the stories don't continue from one issue to the next, there are some themes that play out throughout his six-issue run. It's definitely a collaboration between him and Declan Shelby because there's not a lot of dialogue in the book. Storytelling from panel to panel becomes very important. There's not a lot of exposition. Moonlight does very little talking, but still, the images that Shelby puts on the page convey the story well and make for a very powerful book with striking imagery. When Wood and Smallwood take over with issue 7, it's a very smooth transition. Again, same thing, one and done stories, very powerful imagery, good storytelling from panel to panel. It's a very experimental style, I almost want to say. And in fact, there's one issue where every panel in the book is actually a video screen. We watch Moon Knight make an assault on this hostage taker and we actually see the story unfold through video captured on cameras or through the closed circuit TV security cameras on the building. So it's definitely an interesting way to uh, watch the story unfold and it made for a very enjoyable read. I feel one of the best things about this book so far is that every story has been one and done. So it makes it very easy to jump on. You can go back and start with issue one or just pick up the latest issue and see if you like it. It's definitely an interesting take on an old character who's never really found his footing and hasn't been able to have a, a huge following. And even though the popularity of superheroes in pop culture is at an all-time high, a lot of people probably don't even know who Moon Knight is. So with this new supernatural, noir, slash superhero take on Moon Knight, perhaps his popularity will reach new levels. 
I've already talked a little bit about how impactful and dynamic the art is. One other thing I'll mention is that the backgrounds are kind of light. I think it gives uh, Moon Knight a chance to shine and he really becomes the focal point of each panel. And that really plays well with the minimalist approach in dialogue that the writers have taken so far. The colors by Jordi Belair, as I said, are spectacular. She does a great job of really using muted colors. So you definitely get that supernatural feel of a dark type world that Moon Knight operates in. Also, these dark and muted colors give a sharp contrast to the white of Moon Knight himself, which really allows the character to jump off the page. So as I said, this latest Moon Knight series from Marvel certainly isn't your typical superhero fare, so give it a try and you might find yourself pleasantly surprised. The second book I'm going to cover today is Cowl from Image Comics. This is a creator-owned project. The book is written by Kyle Higgins and Alex Siegel, and the art is handled by Rod Rice. Now, this is a story that Kyle Higgins has been working on for a very long time. In fact, Kyle Higgins produced a film called The League as his senior thesis in college. The main idea of the book is that these superheroes have banded together to create the Chicago Organized Worker League, or COWL. The book is set in the 60s in Chicago, and the heroes have organized to protect the city from super-powered threats. As issue one opens, we see that the heroes of Cal have taken out the last member of the Chicago Six, a nefarious group of villains who have been terrorizing Chicago for many years. So the question arises if Cal is still needed, especially since their labor contract is up and they're in the midst of renegotiating with the city. So it's a very political book, definitely heavy on the characterization. I've heard it described as Mad Men kind of meet superheroes. I really couldn't say how accurate that description is. I've never watched an episode of Mad Men. What I do know is that the book definitely does a good job of capturing kind of the turbulence of the 1960s, especially with the style of art that Rod Rice brings to the book. There's a certain charm on the surface. You definitely get a 60s feel, but you can see just below the surface there's a, almost an anger or a volatility that you see to a lot of the characters, like they're on the verge of a breaking point. And so I feel that Higgins and Siegel have certainly captured that feel of the 60s where it was a time of change, it was a time of uh, very much of uncertainty, and that definitely comes through with the characters and the story they're trying to tell. As I mentioned, the art by Rod Rice does an incredible job of conveying all these emotions, especially with the facial expressions. What it also does extremely well is it shows uh, a sense of history or, or of some age. You, you can tell you're kind of looking into the past. That probably has a lot to do with the colors also. Rice's art style is uh, very kinetic, a little bit sketchy, not a lot of clean lines, definitely some exaggeration for effect, especially in the facial expressions. It suits the book extremely well. I got a chance to talk to Kyle Higgins at Long Beach Comic Con this last September, and I'm going to play that conversation for you now. All right, this is Jace with The Comic Source here with Kyle Higgins, writer extraordinaire. Uh, his current book coming out monthly is Cowl from Image Comics. So, Kyle, I want to thank you for joining me here at Long Beach Comic Con. And uh, I wonder if you remember the first comic that you ever read. <laughs> uh, you know, I've actually been asked that before, and I don't have a definitive answer. It was either an issue of The Flash that um, that Mark Wade wrote. It, was, it would have been Mike Raringo's first issue. Um, it was either one of those. It was either that, or uh, more likely, it was probably um, a Ninja Turtles comic that was like a tie-in to the cartoon. Because I was a big Turtles fan from the age of like you know like three. Yeah, most of us were. Yeah. Um, other possibility would have been. I do remember there being some Batman comics from like the like this like 60s reprints and stuff 60s 70s reprints at my grandma's house and just knowing when my grandma moved it would have had to have been when I was about four years old somewhere in there so comics were always a part of your childhood you always remember them being around well I mean I was familiar with them as a thing but I didn't really start reading them until um, 
in a, on a regular basis, like the early to mid '90s. Like I discovered the X-Men animated series, and then from there, I had a friend who was a big Spider-Man fan, and so it was during the Clone Saga stuff. But he got me reading the Spider-Man stuff, and um, and then there were like reprints of old Marvel comics uh, in like hardcover editions at my school library that I would check out. And so I was more a fan of the characters and the idea of superheroes than I was of the actual comics themselves initially. Um, but then it was it was actually Chuck Dixon's Nightwing run that turned me into a monthly reader, like every month. Because um, that's classic stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, like all the Spider-Man stuff that I was reading before that, it was impossible to follow month to month. Because it, it was just a very convoluted time in the right. Spider-Man mythology. Right. But... All right, and the next thing uh, that I want to talk about is actually a little bit uh, about Nightwing. I know he's your favorite character, and uh, you kind of started pretty early in your writing career working on Nightwing. So now that you've worked on him, now what? You have another character that you really like to work on? <laughs> yeah, the ones I create. <laughs> um, no, I mean, actually, there is an element of that. It's like you 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 do your favorite thing, you do the thing you've always wanted to do, and then what? Um, I'm still doing some Batman stuff. Um, there are still some characters out there that, that I would love to, as far as, you know, Marvel DC characters that I would love to, to do, to, to work on. Um, I'm still a big Spider-Man fan. Um, let's see, the Winter Soldier is a favorite of mine. Havoc is a favorite of mine. Um, mostly Marvel characters, actually. Like, the, the Batman and Nightwing and, and Robin were my favorite characters, but I actually grew up more of a Marvel reader. Right. Um, beyond that, though, I really am pretty focused on, on the stuff I'm doing in Image, and Cowell is just kind of the beginning. I, I've got some other stuff coming up with them that is is really cool. It's different. Um, it's stuff that I'm able to stretch my wings on, and you know, it's stuff that I that I own and control. Right. There's a lot to be said for that. Oh, yes, yes. What's interesting uh, about what you said a lot of times when I ask writers uh, who they'd like to work on, they name icons. You name kind of a little bit uh, more obscure characters. I like that. Uh, maybe not the, <laughs> the, the first one you think of would be Winter Shoulder or Havoc. So that's interesting. Yeah, I mean. I would, like don't get me wrong I, I would I would love to do a run like a, a proper run on Batman someday um, the bigger characters can be really cool to work on and kind of all the things that go along with working on them as far as the material is going to be widely read um, you know it, it might do things for your fan base as well um, and you know the stories that you're writing Hopefully you're passionate about them, but the bigger the character, the more hurdles that you're going to have working right. on them. Maybe you know? the stories have been told. To maybe, some extent. maybe the stories have been told. Um, maybe uh, there's more of a spotlight on you internally at the company you're working at. Um, you so know, you have less freedom. Yeah, exactly. Freedom. So then you get into a, a situation where maybe you're not writing the story that you really wanted to write, and so then you're just unhappy about what you're writing. You know, and so it, there are pluses and minuses anything and um, I don't I don't know yeah I mean look it'd be awesome to write Spider-Man or it'd be awesome to write uh, you know the X-Men at some point but uh, I'd also be just as happy writing a little Havoc one shot you know? right. cool uh, well with issue 5 of Cal that just came out uh, it was a real twist going forward. Now, personally, I felt that there was an extreme balance of action, uh, political, and mystery in the first four issues. Now, with this twist, do, uh, can we expect to see the same kind of balance, or is it going to switch more over to action? What do you what no, can you say about that? No, it's, it's the same balance. Um, the, the idea at the end of the issue that Jeffrey Warner is essentially creating a false flag operation and, and orchestrating the return of villains and the creation of new kind of villain identities in order to perpetuate Kyle's existence is not as easy as it sounds, you know. Getting people to actually be villains is kind of a whole other thing. So the political elements are still going to be there. Um, there might be more, slightly more action, you know, now that I think about it, um, just by the nature of what uh, the direction of the series is becoming and, and the idea that, you know, the villains and the threats are coming back. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, it'll be totally pretty consistent with the first arc. 
that's the stuff that interests us, and that's the style that you know we really re respond to as fans and as uh, you know consumers of entertainment. Right. I, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear you say that it's going to stay the same because you guys are just killing it so far. Oh, thank you. It's interesting. It's kind of a. It's it's still kind of a, a pretty under the radar book, you know, in, in our in our opinion, and that's not a bad thing. Um, the audience seems to be growing for it, but uh, you know, it's at least in our minds, we're just it's kind of just our little, you know, it's our little vanity project that we're right. doing, you know. And, and so the people that have come up and know the book so far, the response has been very, overwhelmingly positive. Very, very positive. Yeah, yeah, which is which is great. And you tend to see that a lot, in my opinion, um, in creator-owned books. I mean, you don't tend to see the same level of kind of cynicism that that you see on uh, from with, with some with some big you know superhero books right and ours is a superhero book but for whatever reason like going off and doing your own thing and, and world building you know it's a lot harder for for readers to go well that's not the that's not the version of the character that I like right you know? um, so it's yeah I feel uh, maybe another part of it is the, the passion in a creator book I feel comes through a lot more yeah, I'd say I agree with that. I mean, definitely with Cowl, it's it's pretty unfiltered. I mean, it's it's raw. I mean, it's 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 everything we want it to be, and 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 it, it, that's the big joy in it for us. Yeah, and Rod's art style really fits that unfiltered feel. Like. Yeah, yeah. All right, Kyle, I want to thanks, uh, thank you for taking the time. Is there anything else uh, you want people to know? Maybe something you can plug, trade coming up? No, not, nothing, uh, nothing that comes to mind. I've got a little Wolverine uh, Sabretooth one-shot coming out in October um, that's tied into the death of Wolverine. And then uh, stay tuned for uh, actually probably beginning of the year, I'll have an announcement about a new series as well. Cool. Is that going to be with Image also? Oh, man. If, if I could tell you, I'd tell you. <laughs> but uh, stay tuned towards the beginning of the year. Okay, we'll look forward to that. All right, sounds Thanks good. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Yep. Well, there you go. I want to thank Kyle Higgins again for taking the time to give me that interview, and I hope you all give Kyle a try. Well, I want to thank everybody for watching. Join me next time for a retro review. I'm going to go way back to the 80s and talk about one of the first comics I ever read, my favorite title from back then, Rom Space Night by Bill Matlow. I'll see you then.